job, everyone. That was, a, that was just impressive right there. Um, my name is Sean, guys, and I'm going to be doing the main talk, the main sermon today. Um, I usually do send out just via email the lesson or just the, the notes that I preach on. So I usually send that to all the, the members of the church. So if you want, if you are just visiting with us the very first time today, they can kind of just forward that to you, just so it's a little bit easier to follow along. But, um, you know, it is great just to see all the different cultures and nations expressed here today. Um, you know, even that we had our, our different prayers in different languages here. Um, I'm sorry for all the Chinese. We didn't have a, you know, a, a Mandarin or a Cantonese praying, but hopefully I made up for it by wearing this. Yeah. Um, hopefully I, I kind of made up for that. But um, it's so great just to see a group of people come together and celebrate different nationalities and cultures. Yeah. Why? Because it's quite rare to see this. Such a diverse group come together, not in a mandatory setting. Like, okay, you might find that at your job, or maybe at university. But other than that, people kind of stick to their own. Yeah. You know? I even heard from a wise man who may have heard it from another wise man, <laughs> but it says that they say that the most segregated day of the week is Sunday. That most, in most churches, you'll see around that they usually just stick to one ethnic group, or one culture, or one group of people. But that really steals from the beauty that the kingdom of God has to express. That the kingdom is supposed to be, the church is supposed to be a sanctuary for all people, for all ages, for all nationalities, for all cultures. And see what would happen though, is that these churches might use the excuse that, hey, well, we feel that we're called to a specific people. Or they might say, well, we only meet with these group of people because some people can't speak the same language. They can't speak English. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. But we understand that language is not the thing that brings us together, right? We know in all cultures, in all places of the world, what is the one thing that always brings us together? Yes, food. <laughs> but no, even more so, it is love. But I would say to argue that it's not just love, I would say that it is God. Why? Because some would argue that it is love, but the Bible actually tells us that God is love. That love comes directly from God. That because all people were made in God's image, that is why we can have love in our hearts. But like I said, where else does love come from? Not only from God, but we all say that love comes from where? The heart. Have you ever wondered though why? We contribute the heart with love. It's very funny, right? All it is is just a vital organ. But we contribute it to love. Actually, a long time ago, they probably could have chose a different organ to say. Instead of saying, follow your heart, they could have said, follow your kidney. <laughs> Yo, do whatever your large intestine tells you to do. <laughs> but, but no, we don't say that. I wonder why. I, I don't know. I have a couple theories of why we contribute the heart to love. I think, one, it's, it's the only one that we can feel when it is working. Mm. All other organs, we can feel when it doesn't work, when your stomach doesn't work with that food that you just ate, mm -hmm. but the heart is the one that you can feel that works. Mm -hmm. It is the only organ that we first check to see if someone's living. Hey, check their pulse. Check if their heart is working. Mm. You know, when it comes down to love and how all of us can be united on that, the Bible actually talks a lot about the heart. If you are just using your Bibles, you can please turn to Psalms 119. If not, just kind of follow along. Come on, Sean. The Psalms 119 talks a bit about the heart and how it can contribute to us living a good life. Verse 1 and 2, it says, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. Now, to give kind of a bit of understanding of what's being written here, is that this writer is not giving us instructions or directions. He's simply writing an observation of those who are quote-unquote blessed, right? He says, blessed are those who are doing these things. This is my observation of what I am seeing. And the word blessed actually means to be superlatively happy, being extremely happy, to have a content in your heart. So he says, hey, when I look at them, I notice that they have a blameless life. They are doing good things. I see that they are following the Bible. I see that they are seeking God. And they are the ones that I see are happy in comparison to the other people that I see. But when you try and look 
out in the world, it is a hard science to find out who's really happy. I'm grateful for Casey, Carlin, Carl, wherever you are going to choose to call her, uh, for just being up here and being vulnerable about her life and her struggle to be open and everything. But that's a hard science to actually look out in the world and who is really happy. Because it's quite easy to, to put on the mask, right? It's quite easy to have a hard day but come in with a smile. And it, it's something that can be faked. And, you know, we run across it all the time, especially when you go out and speak to different people. And you meet people on university and they're doing their degree and everything. And you talk to them, hey, how are you doing? Everyone always responds, yeah, I'm okay. But then you get deep in their life and you see that they, they don't really have a purpose. They don't really have, have, have content in their life. But happiness, yes, it can be hard to see who's really happy. But here, as I come to realize, you can't fake being blessed. To be superlatively happy, you can't fake that. You can fake to put on a smile, but you cannot fake being deeply happy, a happiness that comes deep within your core. So it says here that he's making this observation. He's like, hey, I know that some people kind of pretend to be happy out there, but I see these guys are blessed. But some people come into the church and they see that people are happy, but they contribute it to the wrong things. They'll come in and they'll say, well, this group, they're, they're happy, they're interactive, they're lovely, they're nice, they're talking to me. But, oh, that's probably because they're around the people that they love. Or maybe, maybe they're happy because they found their purpose. Maybe they're happy because they have a lot of friends and family. Well, yes, that's kind of true. Those are things that make me happy. But those are not the things that make me blessed. The things that give me a deep happiness, it says here back into the Bible, is that it's from having a relationship with God, yeah. seeking Him with all our heart. And even Christians sometimes can get that messed up. Yeah. They come into the church or they're a part of the church and they say, hey, I'm not happy. Uh, I guess I just have to, uh, I don't know, put my hands more to the plow, put my hands to work, do more things. No, you're forgetting what it's all about. Yeah. Go back and it tells us just to seek God with all our heart. But it says there, right, to do something with all your heart. What does that conceive in your mind? For most, we would understand it as give all your effort. Now, in most cases, that is true. But to give your heart, all of your heart to a relationship, it's doing exactly that. Giving every piece of your heart. See, it means more than effort. It means give every bit of your heart. Even the, heart, the bits of your heart that you don't want to give. The parts that are sad. The parts that are regretful. The, 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 the embarrassing parts. The weak parts. It says, give all of that to God. Give all of it. Meaning, when you are doing something with all of your heart, you're at risk. You are vulnerable to being hurt. So it says here that those that are blessed seek God with all their heart. Meaning, they seek God with their shame. They seek God with their guilt. They seek God with their demons. And so today, that's what we're going to be talking about, is how to have a blessed life, but just taking it by what the Word of God says here. So my title of my sermon today is simply, Seek God with All Your Heart. I have two simple points for everyone. Point number one is going to be why. Point number two is how. Let's just make it extremely simple today. So point number one, why. Why should I seek God with all my heart? That's a very necessary, but sometimes annoying question. Why? Right? Yeah. Have you ever told someone to do something that's good for their life, but you just didn't have the explanation of why? Just, just please, just do it. Trust in me. It's also a question that can never have an end. Oh, why should I come to church? Because it will be good for you. Why does it matter if it's going to be good for me? Well, because it will make me happy. Why do I need to be happy? You just, why, 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 why? Yeah. Right? If you ever have like a little sibling or a niece and nephew, that's one of the most annoying questions is why. But again, it is necessary. But when we talk about why, guys, when it comes to why, you have to make a decision in your own heart. You have to have an end to your why. You have to be willing to let your heart be convinced that this is enough to make a major change in your life. If you're just going to keep on chasing some why that you're never going to get, you'll never make a change. So we come up to our first why, and this is actually a scripture that Chris read earlier today for contribution, in Matthew chapter 6. 
Now, if you have the email, I'm just going to drop down a bit just because Chris kind of stole half my sermon here. Um, just down to verse 29. So, Matthew 6, verse 29, we'll read the end bit of it. Uh, 29 through 34. It says, Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. He's talking about the, the, the grass of the field. If this is how God calls the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So, what shall we, uh, so why do you worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom. And his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have enough, excuse me, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble, trouble of its own. You know, previously explained from Chris is that God was, or Jesus was here speaking to people, and I'm like, Look, you guys, you're, you're worrying about all the wrong things. You're chasing after your, your, your food, your drink, your clothing. These things aren't, aren't that important. And he ends it off with this question right here. He says, you know, how can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? What a question. See, if, if love wasn't the thing that brought us here together, what's another thing that we have all in common? We worry about things that are outside of our control. Mm -hmm. Everything else, right? If we had like, hey, instead of having an international day, if we just came up to you, invited you and say, hey, we're going to have a day about talking about everything we worry about. Everyone would be like, well, i got about five things I'm worried about. Let me, let me come. I want to express and see if I can get some help from you. But this question just attacks that worry right there. He says, how can any one of you buy worry at a single hour to your life? So many times we worry about how many years we're going to have on this spinning rock in the cosmos. But he says simply, you can't even count your hours. You're worrying about if you're going to get it to make it to 80 or 85. The next hour, you can't have any control over it. He puts it, he puts it back down into perspective. So what's the point then? Say, so why, why are you worrying about your job? Your studies, your goals, when they will do nothing for you. So many people are trying to build a career when you should be focused on creating a life. Very different concepts of your focus. He brings this up to us of why do we seek God with all of our heart? Because it's the only thing worth giving all our heart to. See, when I say there's nothing else that's, that, that, that's worth your value, there's nothing else worth all your heart, I mean nothing. Some people might argue, okay, what about love itself? What about my, my, my family? Or what about my, my relationships or my wife, my kids? I say, no, nothing. Why? Because even in my own life, I, I got to uh, the blessing of marrying my wife, Tegan. Mm -hmm. But I think about it. What a tragedy it would have been if I met her before I met God. Wow. Wow. What a tragedy that would have been. Man, that, that would have been one of my biggest regrets. Because before I met God, I, my love was defined how the world defines love. That wasn't real love. I would have treated her with the same disrespect as I did with other women. I wouldn't have honored her. I wouldn't have respected her. I would have treated her exactly how the world uh, trained me to treat women. Just as an object, something that I can get from her. So, yes, I do love my wife, and I give my whole heart to in my relationship. But that wouldn't have been the same if I, if I didn't meet God first. We even have a running joke in our relationship. We'd be like, actually, I wouldn't have liked you if you weren't a Christian. <laughs> Before you, whoever you were, before you got converted, nah, I wouldn't have liked it. We both agree and smile. But it's saying here that, that the only thing worth, the reason why we see God with all our heart, is the only thing that's worth your value. Most preachers at this time might actually try to put on your heart that life is short. That it's unpredictable. Or that tomorrow is a, is a hopeless thing to believe in. But instead, I want to play on our naivety and say, life can be long. We all believe that anyways. We all think we're going to live tomorrow. Okay, let's play on that then. We're all going to live to 80. We're all going to live to 85. Let's just, let's just roll with that theory then. Well, I think it's even worse. Facing another purposeless life for 60 years without God. 
Mm. Imagine that. Let's say your life is as long as you want it to be. Imagine another 60 years, 50 years, whatever it may be, of having no purpose, of having no real love. That seems almost worse to me. Why, why, why do that? See, each one of us in our hearts, and I believe this is one thing that actually proves God, is that we know we are valuable. See, most atheists will treat other people with value, but deny the creator that gave it to them. See, if you believe that, okay, the cosmos just created us and we're just protoplasm in stardust, then you have no value. This scripture that says, hey, you're more valuable than the grass, that actually doesn't contribute to you if you're an atheist. The same process that created the grass created you, and therefore you have equal value. But yet, all humans in our heart, we don't believe that. But yet, people will deny where, what gives them value. And so, this is one of the things, even in theology, and as you talk about you know, all the different theories of where life is, there's one thing's morality and your value that actually proves God. And because of this, this is a reason to find your value. But why do people find it so hard, though? If I'm saying, okay, give your, all your heart to God, but they find it hard because the things that are difficult to give up are the things that are connected to their identity. Right? So you're telling me that, that I, I don't have to give all my heart just to my studies? You're saying I don't have to give all my heart to be a doctor or a teacher or whatever my goals are? Well, then, if I'm not a student, then what am I? If I'm not a son, if I'm not a daughter, then, then what am I? But if I'm not a, a teacher, then where am I? But you know, it's a sad thing if, if your occupation is connected to the purpose or your value. Wow. But yet that is what the world has taught us because they don't know what else to connect it to. They denied the creator so then, okay, well, it must be your, your, your talents then. That's what gives you value. It must be your family. Well, that's not universal. Right? Okay, maybe you do have a loving family and a brother and sister and a niece and a nephew that you can go and get love from. That's not everyone. So you're saying that you're more valuable because you grew up with a great family than someone else? We wouldn't connect that, right? So if, if your, your theory has to be consistent to the whole world, if it's going to be a real theory, in the same way, we, we all have that connection that we are all valuable regardless of where we come from, whatever flag we contribute our, our life to, we all have value. Yeah. And so we have to take that away as the things that we're holding our identity towards is not who you really are. If you get your hand cut off and you can't be that teacher or that, 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 that guitarist that you want to be, that's, that doesn't lower your value at all. So it says here, seek the things that will show you your true identity, which is a loving son and daughter of God. Come on. But people, if you're coming here and you're already decided that, hey, actually, I, I'm in love with the world. I, I, I want to go and continue to, to have my purpose and what the world tells me to do. Then, I, sorry, I can't, I can't ever convince you anything of it. Enjoy the food. Go out and seek what the world has to offer you. But I guess I just want to warn you with one thing is that though you may fall in love with the world, the world will never love you back. You know, it, it'll love what it can get from you. You'll love what you can have, what you have to offer, but it's never going to love you back. Your boss is not going to visit you when you are sick. Your, your professor is not going to care when you're killing yourself to please him if you fail or not. You're, he's not even going to remember your name next semester. Doesn't care. You are a commodity to the world. You're an item to be used and forget it in the next generation. See, the first reason I want to put on your heart of why we seek God is because he's the only thing worth seeking. It is in him that we can really connect with the value that we already feel in our hearts. I want to show you a second reason in Acts 17, 26 through 28. So the first why is you are valuable and live a life according to that. Verse 26 to 28 says, From one man he made all nations, this is God, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times and histories in the boundaries of the land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, he is our offspring. 
Now, the scripture kind of does say a lot. It can be kind of confusing. But it simply states that God has set a time and a place to give you an opportunity to seek him with all your heart. Pretty much that's what it's saying. He set up the times and the places, giving you an opportunity to really seek out him with all your heart. He's putting you in the perfect conditions to do so. But time is a, is a funny thing when we think about it. You know, we, we actually give time more personality sometimes than we do the heart, actually. Because we say things like, it's the wrong time or it's the right time. We try and make time. Or sometimes we accuse people of killing time. We claim that we have none of it or we have too much. We spend time like it's a dollar, but it costs more than any other thing. So we give time actually like personality. Yet, time is the only thing that's consistent in our lives. It's a thing that never changes. Having too much or too little, that, that doesn't actually make very much sense. All these things are not true. They're just excuses of why we don't do the things we need to do. That's why. Oh, I don't have time. It's too much. It's too little. I, I ran out of time. No, you, you've always had the same amount of time. You're just not doing what you need to do. Yeah. And we have, to our own injury, replaced the word life with time. So you are not wasting your time. You are wasting your life. Wow. And we replace those words because it's a little bit easier to accept. Oh, I just wasted that day. I wasted that minute. No, you, you wasted your life that moment. And what a beautiful thing to waste. See, there are things that in events and situations in our life that actually get us to question everything that we've done. To look back at our time or quote unquote our lives and say, how, how, how have I spent it? Yeah, have, I, have I done what, I, what I'm supposed to do? So just to get open about in my life and one event that I can look back that has actually really taught me the value of the time that I have on this earth is um, growing up, my, my uh, father passed away when I was two years old and my mom later on when I was 14. But when my father passed away when I was two, my mom didn't handle it very well. And instead, she went off to drugs to kind of be her support. She ended up getting addicted to heroin. And so by the age of seven, um, me and my brother were taken away from my mom and put in an, orphanage, in an orphanage, and we were there for about a year, but thankfully we got adopted into family, so I got to still spend my life with my other brothers and sisters. Um, but for the next couple of years, when seven to 14, my mom continued to battle the drug addiction, um, and she soon became actually victorious over it. She, she, she overcame it. But that didn't mean that we were able to return to her. Um, she also contracted AIDS during that time. And that's actually how my father passed away. Um, and I remember it was, um, it was, uh, so it was, it was a week after my birthday that, um, I went into the hospital. Um, my stepmom told me that this was going to be the last time I would see her. Um, and uh, she, she was like pretty much skin and bones at that time. Um, if you know what AIDS is, it, 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 it kind of destroys your immune system. You get a common cold and you die from that. And she wasn't eating or drinking. And um, I, I remember going there with just a shame because it was a week after my birthday. And I was mad at her for not getting me a present the week before. And I just went there and I, I couldn't really speak to her. And it was just really hard. Um, but that moment just gave me this, this understanding that she tried to do everything to get us back into. And I, and I love her very much and still forgiving her for everything. But she couldn't get us back in her, in her life. It, it, it was done with. And it taught me this one saying is, beware of trying to regain a life that you have already wasted. See, our last reason, our reason here is that, guys, we, we, you might convince yourself you have a little bit of time or the time that you're spent is doing all these other things that aren't worth your value. And don't get to a point where you look back at your life and say, man, I should have done something different. 
that this teaches us here that we need to start seeking God now. Yeah, come on, Sean. That tomorrow isn't promised, or even if you have the next 60 years, it doesn't matter. It is to start seeking God. Come on. And our last reason here that we're just going to read very quickly, John 4, 30, uh, 23 through 24, is simply that God loves you. So yet a time is coming has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father and the Spirit and in the truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God's Spirit and His worshipers must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, this lesson obviously is titled, Seek God, but this actually teaches us that He's seeking us. That it's not just, hey, you got to care about me, but He's saying, hey, you got to actually, I, I care about you and I, I want to seek a relationship with you. And it says here that when we are ready to worship Him in the way that He deserves to be worshipped, meaning with full desire in the Spirit and in truth, is that are the people that He's trying to seek. So from my point one, my challenge is, are you ready to seek God with all your heart? Some of you may have come for a different purpose today. You know, oh, it sounds like a cool event, the International Day or the food or whatever. Uh, but just because you came with a one purpose doesn't mean you can't leave with another. Yeah. So I just want to put on your hearts, guys, and start to really seek God with all your heart. I'm not just talking about all your effort, but all the things that you're afraid to seek God with. Your shame, your guilt, the things that you do not want to get open about. Seek God with that part as well. So point number two, how? Another easy question, right? Another important question. Seeking God is not like seeking a relationship with another person. Right? So this question how is quite understandable. Like we have previously discussed, God is love, but he's a lot of other things as well that we can understand of him that can help us pursue him. So I want to say that he is also truth. The Bible says that he is love, but the Bible also says that God is truth. So let's read this verse here in Acts 17, 10 through 12. It says, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas, these are pretty much preachers during that time, to Berea, and that's just a, a, another city there. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those of Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So it says here pretty much that there's this traveling preacher he went first to a place called Thessalonica, and then he traveled along to a place called Berea. And he said that those in Berea, in comparison to those in Thessalonica, had a more noble character. And it kind of talks about why, uh, why because of what they did or how they responded to his preaching. But some today, you know, have come, you guys are coming here, and you're sitting there and telling yourselves, wow, what an amazing speech, right? You're probably saying to yourself, what the? Best speech I've ever heard. At least I, I hope you're saying that. <laughs> uh, but in truth, what I say could be good or not. Uh, but sometimes, I'm like he's saying that that sounds all good, but I lack faith. All he's saying that sounds awesome, but I still don't believe in God. Well, just like here, these Jews in Berea. We're in the same place that you sat. They, 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 they lack faith, but they started to believe because of what Paul said. No, right? It wasn't as a result of Paul's preaching, how great his speech was. It was because they went back to the Bible. Yeah. These men, they didn't gain their faith off of Paul being a great speaker, but because they went to the source of God. They went to the Bible to find the truth. But truth, that word even today in society is very controversial. What is true anyway? We go out there and we, we actually have on our hearts, but I can't believe in anybody. I can't believe others, what they say. Um, you know, they, they might not even be deceitful. They just might not be in knowledge. They might not actually know what the truth is. We can't believe in Google. That thing gives us, you know, millions of different search ones. Which one do we click on? I, I don't know. Um, and we inherently doubt everything our parents tell us. Right? Especially through the teenage years. But so, so what do we believe? See, if you really want to know the truth, read the Bible. Some will even have questions about its validity. Validity. There we go. That's a hard word. 
that's the truth. But validity, yeah. right? They have questions. Okay, well, men wrote it. But how come we can answer all those questions? Just read. Yeah. Just start reading the Bible. Because once you start to begin to read, you'll start to see yourself. You'll start to see the world a little bit differently. Why? Because you are starting to now to not just know another perspective, but the truth about who you really are. You know, you'll react and say, well, you know, so what you're saying here, if I start to read the Bible, that means I, I don't need to follow what the world tells me to do. I don't need to just, just, just have value with what people say I'm valuable in. You'll start to actually change your mind. See, this is the first how of actually how to seek God with all your heart is just pick up the Bible and read it. Guys, coming to church and everything, that's great. That's awesome. I'm, I'm glad that you are here. Listening to my speech, I'm grateful and, and thankful that you're giving me the respect that, that I, I'm able to speak to you today. But that's not what it's all about. I'm, I'm not the truth. I don't speak the truth. There's things that I'm saying here. You've got to go double check and, and triple check of what I'm even saying is correct. But just simply the only thing that I, that I can have confidence in, anything part of my speech is when I read the Bible. That's the only thing for sure that is true. Anytime that I'm up here reading the Bible, that's true. Everything else I say is just kind of sprinkles on top. <laughs> Hopefully it's right. Kind of, you know, you, you can make the, your own judgment on that. But the first way, we simply need to read the Bible. But reading helps our hearts. But we also know that it's not just our heart. Excuse me. Reading helps our mind. But we know that our mind are not the real thing that controls our body. body. It is our hearts. Yeah. Our hearts control our body. So here's our, my second how. Is in Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. Thanks, John. This is a letter just to some people in, in, in slavery and exile at this moment. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places that I have banished you, declares the Lord. And will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So here, this is a letter written to people that have been in slavery and taken away. And it's saying here, just in the beginning, even though they're going through a difficult time, God says here, I already know the plans. I know them. I know the plans I have for you. And he describes these plans as, as being awesome, that they're already on the table, that he's just simply waiting for them to take it. See, in context, what was going on for these people is because they were in slavery, they started to put their ears to, to false prophets and false teachers. And these false teachers were telling them, hey, it's not going to be that long. It's going to be okay. It's, it's going to change really quickly. But Jeremiah, instead of speaking from God, was saying, no, you're going to be here for 70 years. And they hated that message. But he said, you're going to be here 70 years because God is waiting for you to seek him with all your heart. So God isn't saying, hey, 70 years you're staying in, in, in slavery because I want you to. God already knows the future. So he's saying, it's going to take you 70 years to put yourself there. So he's already saying, I've seen that the next 70 years, I'm warning you guys. But unless you just seek me with all your heart, you're, this is where you're going to remain. And how does God know when they start to seek him with all their heart? He says, I will know when you come and pray. Me. That's when I'll know that you're seeking me with all of your heart. Have you ever had someone not willing to talk to you? Or they shut you out of their lives? How does that feel? You get in an argument with somebody and they're just not willing to answer your phone calls? Doesn't that just feel what have I done? Just, just speak to me. Just talk to me. Yeah, that, that feels just so disheartening. Well, God doesn't feel any better when you don't speak to him. See, praying is when we get to speak to God. So you can read all you want in the Bible, but if you do not pray to him, if you don't speak to him, you can't have a real closer relationship with God. You are not yet seeking him with all your heart. So just simply ending it off, what are the two hows? Simply go and read your Bible. And second thing is go and pray. And now those two things, they kind of sound quite simple. But if those are things that you may have not done before in your life, get with somebody who brought you out today. Ask them, like, hey, can you teach me how to pray? Can you teach me how to understand the Bible? 
Because it's quite awesome once you actually start getting into it and really giving your whole heart and every aspect of your heart to this, then you actually get to find your value. And one last scripture, I just want to end it off and just kind of security while doing this, is Matthew 7, 7 through 8. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who finds, excuse me, seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Meaning that there is a one guarantee here in life. The only people say out there the only things that are guaranteed is your funeral and taxes. But it's God is giving here a third one that if you seek him, you will find him. See, if you have a good career, if you have a good marriage, those aren't guarantees that that's going to last for life. It says here, if you just simply seek, if you simply ask and knock, you will find God. And so I hope that yes, we get to enjoy the food as it's going to start to come out and get to you know, enjoy each other's different cultures and nationalities. But more than that, guys, I hope that you walk away making a true decision in your heart. Like, hey, let me actually try this. Let me try seeking God with all my heart. And thank you very much. Wow.